I'm just so excited to see my students, I might cry. <laughs> Excitement, nerves, and anxiety as parents get ready to send their kids back into the classroom for the first time in nearly a year. We'll tell you everything you need to know for next week. Plus, the Spokane Arena may not be accepting new vaccine appointments right now, but our vaccine team has got you covered. We'll explain what your options are to still get your shot. Tracking some patchy freezing fog in the overnight hours, but the weekend's looking pretty good. Details are next. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Kremlin News at 5 tonight. I'm Mark Hanrahan. Welcome everyone. I'm Whitney Ward. New tonight, another vaccine is getting close to being approved by the FDA. Just today, an FDA advisory panel endorsed authorization of the emergency use of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. The panel voted unanimously to recommend the vaccine for people 18 years old and older. So if the FDA now follows this recommendation and approves the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it would be the third vaccine authorized in the U.S. and the first vaccine that only requires one shot and can be stored in regular refrigerators. Globally, Johnson & Johnson's vaccine shows an efficacy rate of 66% in preventing moderate to severe disease and 85% here in the U.S. for severe illnesses. It is well tolerated and safe. We enrolled more than 19,000 participants in U.S. paid particular attention to include the diverse population. Now, Johnson & Johnson says it does expect to provide 20 million doses by the end of March. Side effects for the vaccine include fever, fatigue, and headache, similar to other coronavirus vaccines. Starting next month, getting the COVID-19 vaccine could be a little easier for those who are eligible. State leaders say more doses are on the way, which would increase the supply by mid-March. This week, the state has allocated 260,000 doses of the vaccine, and next week, the state is expecting 280,000 more, which is an increase of 20,000 doses. State officials say this is good news after weather delays held up 90% of Washington's supply just last week. Well, today, Chaz Health opened the COVID-19 vaccine clinic at Gonzaga University. It started at 9 this morning and runs until 5 p.m. The clinic will be open daily until March 2nd. Patients can get vaccinated at Gonzaga's Fieldhouse in the Martin Center or in the parking lots adjacent to the McCarthy Athletic Center and the School of Law. Vaccines are available at appointment only for those who are eligible under the state's phased vaccine distribution plan. That includes those 65 years old or older, Chaz will be coordinating directly with their patients on scheduling their appointment. So Gonzaga leaders said they applied through the state to become an appointment distribution site for the vaccine. They say extra traffic is expected to create congestion in the area of Trent, Cincinnati and Hamilton streets. Campus parking lots next to the McCarthy Athletic Center and the law school will be discouraged while the clinic is open. They expect up to 1300 visitors daily. We're going to take a quick break from the coronavirus headlines because we want to talk about the weather. It was beautiful once again to see the sunshine out there. We also, though, saw some grapple. I saw it on my way into work today. Yeah, about four o'clock, maybe a little bit before it was mm -hmm. coming down outside, right? Let's check in with meteorologist Tom Sherry for what's in store for the weekend. Tom? Well, actually, that lets us know that we're starting to transition out of winter weather and more into early spring weather as we get ready to say goodbye to uh, February and hello to March. We're going to track a little patchy freezing fog tonight. Then over the weekend, I've got sunshine on Saturday with some clouds rolling in on Sunday. Right now we're at 39 degrees, well above freezing. Wind is out of the west at 11 miles per hour. As you can see, radar is showing some snow showers down at areas of southeastern Washington, especially as you get into the Blue Mountains, the higher elevations. Also a few uh, rain showers there. We've got a few isolated showers here locally, but we don't look for much in the way of any kind of accumulation. As a matter of fact, after the fog overnight, I think we should see sunny skies on Saturday and the high of 41 with a daytime high, excuse me, a high of 40 on Saturday and a high of 41 on Sunday. I've got temperatures in your seven day forecast that get up to 50 degrees. I'll tell you when that happens coming up in a few minutes. Love seeing those sunshine icons on your graphic there, Tom. Thank you. New information tonight about where to get a COVID vaccine, despite the fact that Spokane Arena is still not accepting new patients. As we reported all week, the State Department of Health is now taking over from Chaz for daily operations at the site. Yeah, but as a result of that transition, they are only scheduling those who need their second doses of the vaccine. They are not opening up any new appointments right now. We also don't know when that's going to change. So I just want to show you some of your other options here to get a vaccine in Eastern Washington. So I'm just starting here on the Department of Health website. It is their COVID-19 page. So you click on here, you're going to have two options. I want you to click on the vaccine locator. When you get there, that is going to bring you down to this page 
which has this map. And when you first get there, you're going to see the entire uh, state of Washington. But I want you to focus up here because you can uh, pare it down by county, which I'm just going to start in Spokane County, but then we'll go take a look at some of the other uh, smaller counties in the area as well. So let's just start with Spokane County. That's going to zoom in. You're going to visually be able to see them here on the map. But I want you to look over here where it says list, because if you look there, it's going to break it down and show you a list of exactly where you can get uh, a vaccine in Spokane County. This is a list of each individual location. But if you start to take a look here in the middle, you'll see right here, for example, at the Deer Park Family Care Clinic, they're not available right now. Fred Meyer Pharmacy on Division, they have appointments available right at this very moment. And as you scroll down, you're going to see actually several places right now have appointments available for COVID-19 uh, vaccines. Now, if you continue to scroll down, you can also again see that it's listed by county. So let's go down to let's look at Ponderay County, for example. Again, they're going to have a list. Let's scroll this up here just a little bit. You're going to see this red no and it says the provider reports they do not have appointments available. But look here in Newport, for example, you can schedule an appointment right now. So I'm just going to click on that. Where that's going to take you is to the Safeway website, which is we know that right now it is Safeway and Albertsons. And if you uh, click on that, hopefully it's still thinking. There we go. And it's going to take you directly to the website where you can start the process of getting your own COVID vaccine appointment. And this is um, only, of course, for people who are eligible. And as you can see, they've listed all of the people who are currently in phase uh, one and phase one a one B tier one. So obviously a lot of people looking for other options because again, the arena right now is not accepting uh, patients for those first doses, but we do know that there are other options available to you. In the meantime, we have been asking state officials across the board how that is going to start happening. When are those appointments going to open up and how you're going to be able to schedule one? Once we have that information, we will, of course, make sure to let you know. All good information there. Meantime, Monday, a big day for Spokane Public Schools. Middle and high school students will return to the classroom after nearly a year of learning from home. Krem 2's Amanda Rowley checked in with teachers and staff at Ferris High School today. She joins us live there tonight. And Amanda, this was an emotional step for teachers and students. Yeah, that's right. Today I spoke to a ninth grade science teacher here at Ferris High School, and she said that she's so excited to see her students that she might cry on Monday and understandably so right now. While many teachers are busy making those final preparations before students return on Monday, some teachers started making those preparations back in January. It's been almost a year since Ferris High School students have seen the inside of their school. They will return to these hallways on Monday and teachers cannot wait. I'm so looking forward to actually having students in the room. I've been teaching in this classroom uh, since September just by myself and just the idea of having kids back in the room is really exciting. Returning students can expect some changes around the building, such as social distancing protocols with desks six feet apart and two lane directions marked in the hallways. In fact, each grade level has an assigned entrance into the building. We have a narrow time of opening the building and then getting classes started, and we don't want the entire uh, student body to converge through an entrance, so we wanted to spread them out, and we figured grade level was the easiest way to do that. This year's ninth graders have not even been to their new school yet. This week was orientation, giving them a chance to get a lay of the land. And I had one student say, I didn't realize how much I've missed being in school, and that was like... Yeah, it's a lot of work for teachers to get ready, but they are more than happy to make sure their class is safe for their students return. We have cleaning protocols in between class with sprays and there's hand sanitizer available for students. It is going to take time for teachers and their students to feel used to being around groups of people again. But Hastings is positive this will happen safely and with a bit of patience. We are here to listen and adjust as necessary and that, you know, we want to make this a positive experience for everybody. Now, a few weeks ago, high school sports also made a comeback. Behind me, you can see the Saxons football team getting in a little bit more practice before their first game tomorrow against Central Valley High School. Reporting from Ferris High School, Amanda Rowley, Creme 2 News. Amanda, thank you so much. Also new information in a developing story that we have been covering all week long. 
36 bus drivers who contract with Spokane Public Schools are off of work still due to contracting or at least being exposed to COVID-19. Now, one of the big questions around this outbreak is where the cases originated. A Durham representative previously had said they were outside of the workplace. We heard from a spokesperson, Ed Flavin, who gave a little more clarity. His statement read in part, some of our employees self-reported exposure outside of the workplace. The remaining positive cases had no known link to our workplace. Some affected employees are family members and roommates, while others self-reported contact with one another outside of the workplace. Spokane Public Schools in the meantime says they are working hard now to inform families of bus delays, but since Durham is its own company, they say sometimes the communication just takes more time. Flavin did want to issue an apology to the families for not being timely in responding to their concerns and promises the company will do better moving forward. The health district is working with both the district and the bus company to get to the bottom of this particular outbreak. Newly released court documents detail what led to the arrest of a Sandpoint man and his brother in connection with the January 6th Capitol riots. Those court documents include pictures of the brothers inside the Capitol. In those pictures, Michael Pope from Sandpoint circled right there in red, his brother William circled in blue. The 10 page document details how Michael Pope traveled from Idaho to Washington, D.C., where he met up with his brother William, who drove to, to D.C. from Kansas. The two were among hundreds of supporters of former President Donald Trump who stormed the Capitol during a joint session of Congress to certify the Electoral College votes for the 2020 presidential election. The complaint alleges that William Pope tried to force open House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's office door by laying his shoulder into it and that he appeared to strike the door several times with his flagpole. A Capitol Police officer also alleges that William Pope ignored his commands to leave the Capitol and resisted the officer's attempt to force him out. As for Michael, the complaint alleges that he and his brother were together while inside the Capitol and that he ignored officers' commands to exit an elevator before several officers physically forced him out of that elevator. For his part, William later called the FBI tip line to turn himself in, claiming he didn't damage any property or engage in any violence. Both men now face seven federal counts, the most serious of which carries a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. You can read more about their alleged crimes on our website. That's crem.com.